Hello and welcome to all of you to this, this our fifth session of our um, catechetical course that we have reserved for it during this Easter time as we prepare for Pentecost. We are following the message of salvation in Christ um, that the Church proclaims, and in fact we are following the Church's calendar as we um, as this as the calendar follows the incarnation of Christ, his ministry, his baptism, his ministry amongst us, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, the descent of the Holy Spirit, and so on. So we are following Christ according to how the Church proclaims it, Christ who has come to us. Last. Uh, um, session we talked about the resurrection and we said how the resurrection is central to our faith and uh, we talked about the evidence that we can tr uh, that we can trust about the resurrection today we're going to focus on the ascension and this um, works particularly well as this week will be ascension on on Thursday will be as the feast of ascension there is a beautiful poem that Malcolm Guide, um, a priest and poet in Cambridge, has written um, for Ascension, and I will try to copy it down in the description, and I invite you to read it if it's, if it's of any help to you, and meditate on it. There are some words that he uses in that, and he says that in the Ascension, Christ brought us to the center of things, and we'll try to explain that, that, what that means a little bit more. In the ascension, as Christ goes into, uh, into the, the, the life of God, Christ brings all of us who are grafted into him to the reality of God. Um, everything that the ascension makes manifest is the fact that, God, that Christ, after his, his incarnation, after his reaching out to us, after his beckoning us in, us, after offering himself to the Father and raising up uh, dead and fallen humanity to God, takes now that humanity into heaven. And that is the real um, uh, reality in which we live. Heaven and earth become part of each other's story, and creation meets its creator as the, as the creator brings it up to himself in heaven. I'm going to briefly read... Uh, the two passages in the New Testament that describe the Ascension. One is in the Gospel of Luke, Luke 24, starting at verse 50. Then Jesus led the disciples out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. He withdrew, um, while he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was car carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple blessing God. The second passage that describes the ascension is in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 1 beginning at verse 9. As they were watching, Jesus was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing up towards heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up towards heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Now, of course, you need to realize that the language that the, the, the writers of the New Testament employ is the language of first century Hellenistic world, where, of a three-tiered universe, whereby the earth is in the mid ocean always. You know, that the underworld is under the earth, and therefore heaven is here. So, of course, if Jesus returns to heaven, he goes up, he's taken up in heaven. But this movement of, this upward movement, going up to God, is, in a certain way, contradicts and invalidates our earth-centeredness. God comes down to us and then lifts us up back to him. What comes down must go up. This pattern of descent and ascent we are called to follow in our lives and in our worship of Christ. Christ is the life that comes to us, transforms us, and takes us to heaven and transforms us so that we may now go back into heaven. Again, this three-tiered universe, we become 
lies like Christ, and we, be, and we are taken up into heaven. So I would like to take with you a couple of moments and look at the ascension in terms of the church here and the liturgy that the church employs to invite us into the mystery of Christ, that Christ uses sacramentally to invite us into his mystery, so that we too may be taken up to the reality of God. At the Ascension, Jesus didn't just leave us with a vague promise of life in, an he in a heavenly kingdom. He left us with the life of God. Now, wherever the head goes, the body must surely follow. And since we are formed into the body of Christ as we partake of the sacramental body of Christ, then being grafted into Christ means that in the, in the ascension, Jesus is taking us to the very center of the life of God. Therefore, we partake of the life of God, the promise of Christ, through the sacrament of the Mass. Jesus promised that he would send us the Holy Spirit. And in the Eucharist, in fact, we Christians believe that Jesus is giving us the pattern, um, the means by, by which to call the Holy Spirit and the pattern by which to, to live our lives in the Spirit as we already live in the reality of the ascension of Christ, in the reality of the center of the life of God. Now, for this reason, I am all vested as if I'm about to celebrate the Mass, because I would like to take a couple of moments, and, uh, and I would like for you to accompany me, so that we can look at the, the, the celebration of the Eucharist, and see how through our prayer life, through our prayers that we offer at the Eucharist, we are encouraged to enter and inhabit the mystery of Christ. Now, immediately after the, the Eucharistic prayer in, in, in starts immediately with the, the antiphon, the Lord be with you and with thy spirit, lift up your hearts, we lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. So immediately the Eucharist is an act of thanksgiving, eucharisteo, in eucharisto, in fact, in, Greek, in modern Greek, um, means thanksgiving. Um, and after the initial prayer, um, which sets out the tone for the season and the festival, we say together, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts. Now, this is uh, the prayer of the 24 elders, but also the song of the angels at, at the Nativity. And we conclude this chant together by the words, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Now, where do we find that in the Gospels? Well, we find that uh, sung to Jesus by the um, rejoicing crowds as he was going from Bethany to Jerusalem, riding on a donkey. So it's the chant of the crowds at the tri triumphal entry with, um, of Jesus. So we too are acclaiming Jesus as King. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The crowds used to say, Hosanna to the Son of David, and we say, Hosanna in the highest. So, immediately, the story warps us at the beginning of um, the, the Eucharistic mystery of Jesus, because this episode in the New Testament happens just before Jesus sits down and uh, shares his last meal, last supper, with his disciples. So, we are taken just there, um, ready to be to share this Eucharistic meal with with Jesus. Now, at this point, what we do in the Mass, the priest prepares the altar. The, the altar, in fact, would have been already prepared at this point. And uh, um, through, um, we said we we have said a short prayer to introduce. Um, the Eucharist, and then at this point, the priest invokes the Holy Spirit to come down. Now, the gesture that priests do when we invoke the Holy Spirit is this in the West. Our hands are folded in a strange way, 
which reminds of the shape of, the, um, of a dove's wing. Because the Holy Spirit appears in the shape of a dove at the story of the baptism of Jesus. Now, um, if, you, if we were in an in a Eastern Syrian church where they use the Eastern Syrian um, Orthodox liturgy, the priest wouldn't just do this simple gesture like we do in the West. He would be doing a lot more dramatic gestures, like fluttering his hands around as if there are birds flying around. Because what we are saying here, what we are praying as a community is for the Holy Spirit to descend upon these gifts on the altar, fill them as he filled the womb of the Virgin Mary, and allowed Jesus to be born as one of us. So just like the Holy Spirit um, overshadowed Mary, and Christ was born amongst us, now we ask the Spirit to descend and fill these gifts, so that they may become for us the true body and true blood of Christ. So in a certain way, we are celebrating with this the Christmas moment, the Christmas moment of the Eucharist. Just like Jesus was born in Bethlehem, which means house of bread in the original Hebrew, we are now going to encounter our risen Christ in the bread that he has given us. After that, and after the, 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 the words of institution, the priest will read the words of institutions, which are the same words that Jesus spoke in the upper room to his disciples when he left this sacrament. And he said, do this every time you want me to be present amongst you. And we say, we say the same words that he has said. This is my body given for you, and this is my blood given for you. And every time at the consecration of the bread, now this is, I do not mean to consecrate anything in this case, so just to make clear, I'm not making, I'm not celebrating the Mass, I'm just explaining here. Uh, but at every consecration, after the consecration of the bread and the consecration of the, uh, of the wine, the priest would lift the consecrated host and show it to everyone, and same thing, the priest would lift the consecrated chalice and show it to everyone. Now, Epiphaneo in, uh, in Greek means, I will show. And this is the, the word from which uh, we get the word epiphany, for example. Epiphany is the moment in which Christ was shown as the light of the world to all nations. And, and kings and wise men from all the corners of the world gathered in front of his stable to worship him. Because the whole world had seen his light. So in a certain way, liturgically, we are repeating that. And we are showing Christ to the whole world, so that everyone may see him and live. But we are not just doing that. At the end, after the consecration of the bread and after the consecration of the wine, the priest will lift both again, saying to you, O oh, Father Almighty, in songs of everlasting praise, we are offering this to God. So the, the priest will offer the chalice and the bread consecrated to God. This is now the Good Friday moment, um, when Jesus offers the whole of humanity to the Father. And also the Easter Sunday moment, because we are saying, we proclaim your death, O Lord, and proclaim your resurrection until you come in glory. So this is the Good Friday and Easter moment, when Human, sinful humanity is put to death on the, on the cross, and humanity, true humanity, is risen together with Jesus. And as we are grafted into Jesus, we rise with him. But, as the chalice and the bread are lifted up and offered to the Father, as the candles are lifted up, if we have acolytes, they would lift up their candles at this point, as incense is swirled around, and if I had um, altar servers, my chasuble would go up as well. As everything is being lifted up, this is also a bit an ascension moment, whereby now the center of our life is taken up in Christ to the very heart of God. So, at this offering, we are now taking our place in the life of God. Only after that, the priest... Who would have broken the bread and wine at that? Uh, who would have broken the bread at that point? Would turn around 
and show this to the congregation, I'll turn towards the camera in this case, otherwise I would have to turn towards the congregation, and say, Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. You see, this is the Pentecost moment. The receiving of the Spirit is not something um, that zaps our mind or deals with our subconscious. No, no, we are receiving the Holy Spirit because Jesus made himself bread for us. And in this, in this gift of self, which is sacramentally happening again, here in the, on the altar, where Jesus is sacrificing himself and offering our life to the Father in his, then we are also offered a pattern in which to live this new life in the Spirit. So, the Spirit who, who, may, who allowed Christ to be incarnate, the Spirit who was active during his ministry, the Spirit that fills the elements so that we can receive the body and blood of Christ, is still beckoning us into this new life in Christ so that we may live in it. And in fact, after everyone receives communion, the priest quickly dismisses everyone. Now, this is the interesting bit. The words of dismissal are very uh, traditionally very difficult to translate. In the original Latin, which was the language in the Western Roman Empire that was spoken at the time when the church was formed, the words of dismissal were traditionally ite missa est, which has been translated in the Roman Missal as go the mass is ended. In common worship is often translated um, go in the peace of Christ, um, it means all these things, and it means a lot more. Hence, the, recently, the revival of this tradition of, say, of leaving it in Latin, because there is no way that it can be translated in modern language. Ite missa est means go. The sacrifice of Christ has already been sent to God. The center of Christ's life is in God. Missa est, it's been sent. Or, go. The Mass is finished, therefore you are being sent. Missa est, in the sense of Mass finished, go. Because now we are sent, just like the centre of our life is now in God, with Christ. We too are to live our lives with, uh, with the knowledge and deep um, assurance that as we are living in God, and therefore all our life here around needs to conform to the life of God, and to its rules, and to its upside-down logic. So we are now sent, Missa est, bis, ite, go, we are now sent so we can beckon the whole world in, so that everyone may see Christ and live in the center of God's life. So, in this way, liturgically and sacramentally, we are invited into the ministry of, uh, into the, the salvation, into the mystery of Christ in our prayer life. In the previous sessions, we have discussed the descent of God to us, to come to find us. Uh, the Bible says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God loves us so much that he is the one that takes the initiative. This is the great difference between Christianity and all other religions in the world. The fact that God himself takes the initiative and comes down to us. So we have looked at the Annunciation. The Holy Spirit flows through Mary to conceive Jesus. He descends into the virgin's womb. At Christmas, God, the Word, descends into the world and is born into a lowly stable in Bethlehem. So he continues this downward movement. He is in a lowly stable, um, born amongst the poor. At the baptism, Jesus descends into the waters. Um, that means he takes the same level as the sinners. Remember that we said the baptism of John was a baptism for repentance of sin. So he now identifies with the sinners. During his ministry, he descends to the lepers, to the prostitutes, to the outcast of society. At Good Friday, he... He makes himself sin for us. He offers the whole of 
the uh, sinful humanity and puts it down on the cross. He descends to death on, on East, Holy Saturday. He descends into hell so that he can actually now save all those that have been made prisoners. So he, we, we follow this downward descent to where it cannot descend any further down. But now what, what goes down must come up. So ascension is the, continue, is the, the upward movement of this parabola. We are now called to go on the mount, as we are grafted into Christ, we are taken with Jesus up to the Mount of Olives. Another thing that might escape the modern reader, olive, olive oil was used um, in ancient times to anoint, king, anoint kings, for example. Wreaths of olive were, were, were made in order to crown um, um, generals that were victorious in battle. So the fact that we are that Jesus goes into the, on the Mount of Olives for his ascension has, carries with itself all these references. But as God comes down and takes us, we saw the icon last uh, week of Jesus grabbing Adam and Eve by their hands out of hell, and now he's taking us to the Mount of Olives so that we too may may go to the life of the Father. Is the culmination of this parabola. Saint Athanasius used to say, God became man so that man might now live with God, might become God, might become God-like and share the life of God. I hope that through this week you are going to be able to, um, obviously we're in lockdown, but at least attend remotely um, the Mass of the Ascension. And you can meditate and pray on the mystery of the Ascension. And uh, in your prayer life this week, stop and ponder on how we, you, me, all of us, might live a more spirit-filled life. If the reality of our life now is in the heart of God in heaven, and our earthly life needs to mirror and live according to that reality, how is the Spirit how can the Spirit be calling us now to make that reality present in our lives, in our interactions, and so on? I'm going to conclude with a short prayer. The Collect for Ascension. Let us pray. Grant, we pray, Almighty God, that as we believe your only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, to have ascended into heaven, so we in heart and mind may also ascend and with him continually dwell who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Well, I, I'm going to see you next week for our final session on Pentecost. I'll give you a blessing. Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Goodbye and see you next week.